thanks a lot for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about open and no longer open problems in uh, weakly interacting Bose gases, or rather dilute Bose gases. So uh, I'm actually not sure that I'm the best to talk about all the open problems, because so I did some work on this uh, back in 2020 and 2022. Uh, so I was together with a former student of mine, Søren Fournet. We proved the Li Huang Yang formula for a certain class of potentials, and I'll get to that, and that's part of the open problems. What is still, for which cases it's still not known how to prove the, the, the Li Huang Yang formula. Uh, but I have to say that since then, I have somewhat left the field. It became very technical. It inspired a lot of young people, and then it's hard to keep up when you're not so young yourself. So I went back and studied an old love of mine, which is atoms, and that's what I do mostly right now. So I'm, I don't know if I'm fully up to date with all the progress and all the open problems, but I'll try as best I can. So let me... Um, let me start with setting it up. Um, so we are, we are looking at the uh, N bosons. And I may say a little bit about fermions as well. And um, we put them in a box. And let me do all dimensions, meaning 1, 2, and 3. Of course, for mathematicians, that's very far from being all dimensions. But I think for a physicist, it's probably close to being all the dimensions. Now, when I say a box, it could also be a torus. Meaning that I would put periodic boundary conditions. And the Hamiltonian So let me call it Hn. And I will use uh, particular units here, and I'll explain them in a second. In a second, and an interaction. Whoops. Let me. Right. So I'm using units in which h bar is one, and the mass of the boson. Is, uh, well, is one half. Uh, so this uh, Hamiltonian acts on the symmetric subspace of the n particles. So it acts on the Hilbert space of square integral boom. symmetric functions on, on the box. So I have, uh, so when I say symmetric, it's of course in the permutation of the variables in, in here. Right? So we would write it as the symmetric tensor product zero L to the D, right, which is a subspace of the square integrable functions on, very good. Now, I have to say something about what we, the assumptions we make on the potential. And the most important assumption is that V is a non-negative potential. And that's actually one of the open problems that I'd like to address is how do we go beyond V being greater than or equal to zero? Because as I will explain in a little bit, this assumption is restrictive. It basically means that it rules out cold atoms. Um, but uh, we do not know how to treat 
V being non-positive. As soon as we have V non-positive, we can form bound states, so that we need to rule out. But in order to prove anything of what I'd like to prove, you have to rule out that there are bound states in any particle set, so not just two particles. You need to rule out two, three, and so on, and that's just an unmanageable assumption in proving anything. But I'll, I'll tell you explicitly where we use it, and it can be relaxed a little bit, but not enough to actually include uh, the, the situation of, say, the co of cold atoms. OK, but certainly one case that's of particular interest is the hard sphere. So I call the radius of the hard sphere A because A will be my notation for the scattering length in a moment which I'll introduce for all potentials. So one thing that's of particular interest to us is to prove universality, meaning that the result really holds for all potentials. Right? But here again, I have to make the assumption that V is greater than or equal to zero. Let me add here that you need some decay, and I'll not be more specific than that, because it, it, that's actually a part which is fairly OK. It's pretty relaxed what you need for an assumption on the decay. For this talk, you may just think of it as being, as having compact support. I mean being, so here, maybe I will think about V being zero outside uh, x greater than some r. So there's the range of the potential, and there is the scattering length, right? For the hard sphere, they're the same, but in general, of course, they're not the same, right? And for cold atoms, I guess you would assume the range to be much, much smaller than the scattering length, but that is not possible when V is greater than or equal to zero. So I'll get to that in a moment. That's why that's one of the, uh, that is one of the open problems. And I will focus here on the ground state energy. On the ground state, meaning zero temperature, and then the energy is simply the infimum of the expectation value and maybe let me call this Hilbert space here let me call that script hn so i need to assume here that psi is in Hn, meaning this is just the square integrable symmetric, uh, symmetric function of all these, all these variables, right? So the psi is x1 up to xn, and it's symmetric, and it's square, and it's square integrable. Mathematicians would worry a lot about whether this is well-defined, the domain is well-defined, and so on, but that's really not an issue, because all the terms here really are positive. So maybe this is, if you try to calculate it, not well defined, but that would just mean it's infinity. So you can really think of it as being defined for everything in the Hilbert space, and it's just infinity if some of the terms evaluate to an expectation which is not finite. And since I'm doing, I'm looking for the inf, it doesn't really matter. So I mean, I'm, I, I don't really have to care about that. Right? And the inf, in the situation I'm in, the inf is really a min. There is really a minimum, so that's not particularly difficult to see. So now, can you still read it up there? You can read it all the way up there? It's too high. Okay, okay, I'll, uh, I'll lower it a bit. But at some point, I think I will move it up when the next one comes up. Okay. Um, so here's another issue that I'd like to address, and that's the question of the thermodynamic limit. So 
my own work really has been to understand this in the thermodynamic limit. There had been a lot of work understanding the ground state energy and its dilute limit in a confined situation, essentially just meaning that you think of this L as being finite and you let the number of particles go to infinity, but you have to rescale things in an appropriate way. I have been interested in doing it in the thermodynamic limit, and I tried to spend a little time discussing the two. But for now, so for me, the, what is of interest is the thermodynamic limit, so I'm looking at L going to infinity, keeping N over L to the D. Well, um, it's enough to just ask that it converges to some number rho, and then we do E, what did I call it, En, divided by L to the D. And it's not a difficult uh, exercise to show that this exists. Uh, it is convex as a function of rho. I mean, it, so that's, that is fairly, that's fairly standard. And in fact, we also have equivalence of ensembles, meaning that if I, instead of formulating it in a canonical setting as I did here, if I introduced the chemical potential instead and then took the limit, the two are in fact Legendre transforms of each other. So, and I will at some point relax it and do it in the grand canonical setting. And I'll explain why, why, that is, uh, why that is necessary. Maybe I should also add that not only does it exist and is convex, it's also independent of boundary conditions, which I didn't address yet. So on this box, 0L to the D, I can choose Dirichlet boundary conditions, meaning that the, I'm thinking of the psi vanishing whenever a particle reaches the boundary. Or I can do Neumann. Neumann really means that the derivative vanishes when you reach the boundary. But you may also think of it as not having any boundary condition at all if you write things in the right way. I mean, but normally it's to say that the derivative, normal derivative, uh, equal to zero on the boundary. And finally, I could do periodic which really means that I think of this being on the torus. Right? And these are really all conditions on the Laplacian. Okay, so what I'd like to understand is this thermodynamic limit, and I'd like to understand it in the dilute limit. So, yeah. No, it, 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 it's, not, it's not for me as, well, I mean, it is important if, which, if you talk about equivalence of ensembles, right? Because if you instead introduce the pressure, which would be a function of the chemical potential, and you want to go between the two and say that you get the same answer be, between the two, the, the, the pressure would automatically be convex. And if you want to do the Legendre transform of the pressure, you'd get a convex function. So if this thing would not be convex, you would actually be calculating the convex hull of that. So in that sense, it is important that it is convex in the thermodynamic. But I'm not going to use it in whatever I say here. But it's also an issue of stability. It is an issue of stability, sure, sure. But you may... Make sure that the stable. Sure, sure. No, it is important that you have convexity. All the thermodynamic properties will depend on, on convexity. But I'm not going to use it very much in, in this talk. But it is important, and it is important to understand the equivalence of ensembles. So maybe I should have mentioned here that we have also equivalent. Ah, let me, let me do that when I, when I get to it. So uh, that, there are two things I'd like to address. Um, so So one is understand uh, e of rho in the dilute limit. So 
so rho going to zero. But of course, I have to make that a little more clear. Rho is a dimension for quantity. So I have to understand exactly how, what do I mean by rho, rho being small, small compared to what. So that's one thing. But another thing you would like to understand is properties of the, of the ground state. And let me mention right away the one big open problem, and that is to establish Bose-Einstein condensation. Because that's one of the things we do not know how to do. It's a big open problem for us. We do not know how to prove BEC. So in particular, ah, let me write it down. And it's important because I actually need BEC to understand the dilute limit as well. And I will try to address the difference between the two. How we are actually able to understand the dilute limit without understanding BEC. When I say that we do not know BEC, so it's an open problem in the thermodynamic limit. L to infinity. It is not an, a problem in a confined system. In a confined system, we can understand BEC. Um, and I, so, so one question I'm being asked often when I give a math talk, <laughs> is why do you bother about the thermodynamic limit? Because all experiments are in confined systems anyway. Now, I'm not so sure that's true, and I'd like to address that question. It's true that they are in a confined system, but I guess the relevance is whether the confined dimensions are comparable to the relevant dimensions for proving BEC. So we can prove BEC for certain length scales. Basically, for the healing length, and slightly larger than the healing length. So there is a struggle. There's even a competition going on among mathematicians to prove BEC on larger and larger length scale, larger and larger compared to the healing length. I'll get to it in a moment. I, will, I do not know where we are on the competition right now. I think my collaborator, Fournay, has the record, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not totally sure since this may change. But uh, there was a question. So it's good. You should really ask the people that work for confined system, but let, I'll, I'll let you know. So, so you, you, you simply take a confined system and you let the number of particles go to infinity. So you still have a limit, and you ask whether most of them are in the condensate or not. Now this, you, you go to the limit of, of infinite density. That's what people do. But you have to rescale everything when you do it. Right? You have to, 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 to have a reasonable question, you have to rescale the potential V. Right? So there is a way that you rescale so that you still, so you're basically in, in the gross pitayevsky limit. So in that limit, you can prove BC. Right? But uh, I, I, I try to address it when I get to what we can prove and how we get around not being able to prove BEC in the thermodynamic limit and still be able to prove the Lee Huang Yang formula for in the thermodynamic limit. OK, but in order to talk about the length scales and talk about what I mean by diluteness and so on, I need to introduce the scattering length. So. So that several ways you can do it. One way is to look at the scattering equation. So minus Laplacian u plus one half v u being zero, will you satisfying a certain limit 
at infinity. Now, this is an equation on r to the d. And you have that uh, u of x is approximately 1 in R3. I mean, for x to infinity, that's the condition in R3. u of x is approximately log x in uh, Let me put it here. So the condition that x goes to infinity is that it is 1. It's Lx. And in, oh, sorry, this is in, this is in R2. And in R1, we want u of x to be. OK, so that's one way to uh, consider the scattering equation and then the scattering length. And now I'm afraid I do have to lift this one up. Right. And then what we really have is that u of x, so in R3, u of x is not just approximately 1, it's 1 minus a over x uh, in R2. Maybe you can see because of the shadow. Let me put it here. Uh, and in R1. And A is the scattering length. So that's one way to introduce the scattering length. Another way, and I guess I have to look at my notes, is actually to look at, so equivalently, to ask what is the energy that I introduced uh, there somewhere over there. What is it if n is equal to 2? So E at, for, for having two particles as I go to large L. Right? So you can get the asymptotic. So in, um, so in one dimension, it's 2 pi squared L minus A to the minus 2. So that is, I'm giving you the leading order up to the correction given by A uh, as L to infinity for two particles for and down here in three dimensions it's 8 pi A L to the minus 3. So this is D equal to 1 D equal to 2, equal to 3. The u, the function u, I will sometimes write as 1 minus omega of x in three dimensions. So now I'm just discussing it in R3, but of course it's sort of obvious what I would do in a in other cases, you see if I have compact support, if my potential has compact support so that the V there is compactly supported, then the U is, Laplacian U is zero outside the, 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 the ball on which V is different from zero. And then these asymptotic, form, asymptotic forms are actually exact. Right? But what sets the A is the fact that it has to be satisfied everywhere. Right? Now in in, one, in three and two dimensions, the A is not negative, but in, the, in dimension one, the A can actually be both zero and, and, uh, and also negative. So one thing to point out is that we have that A is less than or equal to the range. If I think of a potential that is, lives inside a ball of radius R. Right? 
So we can never have a scattering length which is much longer than the range as you would expect to have for cold atoms. If you want to have a situation like that, you must relax the condition that V is greater than or equal to zero, and then we do not know how to, how to analyze the problem. Yes? Right, but I think in the experiments where people have analyzed the Li Huang Yang formula, the, the range is much smaller than the scattering length. Yes, no, that, that, that's true. And, and in fact, the range being of the order of this, the two being of the same order, that's the hard sphere. I mean, for us, that's the hard sphere case. So we can go down and analyze, almost analyze the hard sphere case. So I'll get to tell you exactly what we know and we do not know in the, in the, hard, sphere, in the hard sphere case. Um, okay, so now the dilute limit that I talked about really means that the density is small compared to having one particle in a ball of the size of the scattering length. So rho a to the d uh, being uh, much, much less than one. That's the dilute limit, right? So the way we would think about it is that we are looking at the limit where rho AD goes to zero. Now, in, in dimension one, that's actually not quite enough to have to say that it's a dilute system because in dimension one, the scattering length may be zero and there is no condition here at all. So there you have to actually have a combination of saying that the range that, that, that it's a combination of rho a to the d and rho r to the d, which is small. But that's only in one dimension. In three dimensions, the dilute limit is rho a to the d being small. Right, so let me not, I will mention the results that we know in one dimension. I'd not, I will not mention the exact conditions, right? So just think of it as being the density being small. So here is uh, what we know. So this is actually, a theorem, but it's a theorem with buts because it's not everything is exactly known and I have to address when we know something and when we do not know something, right? So we always have to assume V greater than or equal to zero. Right? But in fact, we will need more assumptions. There was the decay assumption. I don't consider that as such an important thing. Just think of being zero outside a ball of some radius R, a range. But there are some growth conditions that we do not know everything that I write here, for instance, for the hard sphere. Right. So let me start at D equal to three. So then the Li Huang Yang formula says that this is And we can prove it with the power on the diluteness parameter rho a cubed, which is better than one half, but not much better than one half. So I'm just writing it as little o of rho a square root rho a cubed as rho a cubed goes to zero. Right. So this is, this is the limit uh, rho a to the d. <coughs> Going to zero. There's some work, and there's the next term, the term predicted by Wu. People are working on that as well, not in the thermodynamic limit. There are results about it in the confined case, but not in the thermodynamic limit. So this is what we know in the thermodynamic limit. Almost. I'll, I'll have to qualify this in a second. In two dimensions, we do not need any qualifications. We know this uh, exactly. So let me introduce this parameter y. Uh, so it's 4 pi rho squared y, 
one. And I was certainly not involved in proving this. Ivan has uh, maybe the first one who got this formula. I don't know. Um, Certainly, I learned about the, the Euler Mascheroni constant appearing there in a paper by you. But, um, <laughs> um, and then it's plus little o of this. So, this we can actually prove. Some people can prove this exactly. Um, and in one dimension, things are completely different. Um, the leading term is not at all rho squared. Uh, it's much rather like a free Fermi gas. So that's, the, that's what you would get if you had a free Fermi gas. And then there's a correction to that, which is 1 plus 2 rho A. And here, I want to be a little bit careful. I'm going to write it as rho little o of rho a, but let me put it in quotation marks because a could be zero, and then this is not really a meaningful, uh, a meaningful quantity. So let me just briefly review the, the, um, the different rigorous results. Yes? No, 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 when the scattering length uh, depend, depending on the, on, the, on, the, on the sign of the scattering length. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was, that was the leading term here. Yes, that's right. Right, that's true. I think that was just the leading term, if I know. I, and I'm not totally sure, but I think maybe you were the first one to get the next terms. But uh, I'm, I'm oh yeah, okay. Also, that also had the, this term here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. That, 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 that's unimportant. Every, every, you always have you always have uh, equivalence of examples. So you. Ah, okay. 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 So, so credit has to be given to Popov. Credit has to be given to Popov. And I apologize, but I also think credit should be given to you. We went beyond Popov. Oh, you went beyond Popov. Because it's equivalent of Mu. Ah, you get. Oh, okay. You get, okay, okay, okay. And this we do not know how to do. No. Okay. Um, but let me, uh, let me just review the. So, what was done. Uh, uh, Rigorously, I mean, I think the leading term here was due to lengths, actually, a long time ago. But rigorously, it took much, much longer. It was surprisingly how long it took to prove the 4 pi rho squared A. And I'll try to explain why, uh, why it mathematically was so difficult. Although today, it's fairly, it's fairly easy. Um, and, uh, and this result here, I'm not sure that was, that was known. So that's some work I did with the, with the uh, PhD, two former PhD students. In any case, up here, the first to do something was Dyson. And maybe I should explain. So the way we, you would go about proving something like this is by proving upper and lower bounds. Right? Because we define the energy as an infimum or a minimum. So if I want to get an upper bound, I have to just produce a psi that gives me the right equation, the right identity. But if I want the lower bound, I have to come up and understand why the psi really looks like that. I have to understand the error terms and what it is that I can throw away and not throw away, and I'll get to that in a moment. Right? But Dyson proved the, uh, I guess I should do like this, the upper bound. And this was in 1957. I mean, I should maybe mention, of course, lens. And this is maybe 1927, 26? <laughs> it's six or seven. And then, of course, there's Li Huangyang. 
I should write it down. I forgot to check whether Li and Yang are still alive. I, I do, Yang is very, very old, right? He's 102, I think. And so that's why I think I should actually check it every time I give a lecture whether he's still alive. So I think he is still alive. I would have heard it. So this was 1957. I want to point this out because Dyson's upper bound was in the same issue of physical review as the Li Huang Yang paper. I think I mean, he even credits them that he, this question was addressed. And um, he did not get a lower bound. The lower bound was by, by this, is the, this is the leading, I should say. I should again be careful. So this was also the leading term. And Li Huang Yang got the correction. And Li Bening Vesson got the lower bound in 1998. And this was also the leading lower bound. Now, I guess maybe it will be a lot of things if I have to write down uh, credits for everyone. So let me just say it. So the upper bound here, that came in 2009. This was work by, Li, uh, by Yin and Yao. Uh, and it's, very, very, it's a very complicated paper. As I said before, you just have to come up with the psi that gives you the right answer. But it's actually very difficult, and I'll try to explain why. And we still do not know this upper bound in the heart sphere case. We do know the lower bound. So the lower bound here was work by me and my former student, Fournet. And this was one of the things that was mentioned in the Henri Poincaré Prize, that we, that we finally proved this. We proved only the lower bound. The upper bound had been proved for a large class of potentials, but not all of them. So I should maybe, uh, so maybe let me just say here that what is needed, so for upper bound in D equal to 3, requires V integrable. So we cannot do the hard core. So hard or hard sphere. So the hard sphere is still open. It's still open in the thermodynamic limit. We do know how to prove the hard sphere in the confined case. There is a version of this formula in the confined case. The scattering length will change slightly because of the confinement, right? Because after all, as you saw, I was defining the scattering length in all of Rd. But if you define the scattering length correctly, you can prove this in the confined case. And you can also prove the upper bound in the confined case also for the hard sphere. For the Lower bound, we do not need any assumptions. We know it for the hard sphere and for the, um, in all cases. In dimension two, we know this in, for all potentials. And in dimension one, we know this uh, for all potentials. Now, this was known for the leap, uh, the leap linear model, where you have a delta interaction. In that case, the scattering length is negative, And you know how to expand it. You have an exact solution. I mean, having an exact solution does not mean that I actually have a formula as such for the energy, but one can expand the energy at, uh, for, for, uh, in, in, in this limit where rho a goes to zero. And, um, and in that case, uh, this is the formula you're getting in the, for the Lieb linear model. You can also do it for the hard sphere. I mean, the hard sphere in one dimension is trivial. That's exactly, I mean, this is just like a, this is like a Fermi, there's no difference between the Fermi gas hard sphere and the boson hard sphere, right? Because they cannot go through each other, so you don't see the sign. So all that happens is that the hard sphere means that the volume is smaller, and, and then you will get this, this answer here again. You have a smaller volume, so the energy actually goes up. Um, so in that case, this, is, this thing is actually, well, no, that's not quite right. This is an expansion of 1 minus rho a to the minus 2. But 1 minus rho a to the minus 2 is the correct, uh, the correct um, 
value for the hard sphere in one dimension. But as I said, we are interested in universality. We'd like to know it for as large a class of potentials as possible, depending only on the scattering length. And in one and two dimensions, we do know it for all positive potentials. In three dimensions, we know it for all positive potentials, except that for the upper bound, we still do not know how to do the hard sphere. Okay, so I'd like to uh, um, maybe address these difficulties. Should we take a short break at some point, or maybe in five minutes, or I don't know. I, I'm fine. Oh, okay, so then I'm fine. So. Uh, Um, yeah, of course, now I cannot, I cannot move this one up, but... Uh. Okay, so let me discuss briefly the upper bound. Um, I will not give the proof that Dyson gave. Um, Dyson gave a uh, proof in dimension three, now I covered it, giving the leading term four pi rho squared a. This was somewhat non-trivial, or quite non-trivial, and actually his error term is rho a cubed to the one-third. So not rho a cubed to the one-half. We know how to prove an upper bound for all potentials with an error term of the order of Li Huang Yang, but we do not know how to get Li Huang Yang for the hard sphere with a small error. So that's the thing we do not know. Um, sorry, I think, I'm sorry, I'm wrong about that. For the hard sphere, we do not know how to get the upper bound in the thermodynamic limit all the way down to rho a square root rho a cubed. We still do not know that. Um, we know better than Dyson rho a cubed to the one third, but we do not know rho a cubed to the one half. Okay, let me go to second quantization. And so the way one usually derives at least heuristically, the Li Huang Yang formula is by doing a Bogol Lyubov approximation. And that's also what I, I'll try to do, and I'll try to do it in a rigorous fashion. So I want to do a Bogol. But you will get my formulation of a Bogol Lyubov approximation. So let me assume that I'm now on the torus. In the big box, the box of size, I mean, L, which I will eventually, I mean, the torus, it's a large torus. Right? Um, so then, I write the kinetic energy, uh, the, the Laplacian, in second quantization, so I'm summing over all momenta. And I guess I should put in a volume here. Um, so if, to do the Bogolyubov approximation, the standard approach is to say we assume that there's BC that there's macroscopic occupation in the momentum zero, so P A, A, A zero. Then we replace A zero by C number substitution by just the square root of the density. We assume not only that, there's, uh, uh, that there is a um, Condensation, we also may make it our life even simpler, assume that we have full condensation and that the number of particles that's not in the condensate is lower order. One has to be more careful uh, if you want to do the calculations 
more precisely, but at least that's what's usually done to first order. And then, so you replace all the zero momenta by square root rho, and then you keep only terms with two and zero a's. Right? Then you have a quadratic Hamiltonian, and you can diagonalize it by a Bogoliubov diagonalization. So that's how it's usually done. That will give you the wrong answer. That will not give you the 4 pi rho squared a, which I no longer have anywhere. It will not give you the scattering links. Right? So there's this famous old paper by Bogolyubov from 1947 where he does the Bogolyubov approximation. He does not derive the Li Huang Yang formula, although he almost has it in the paper. Right? He just overlooked maybe a slight renormalization. He does realize, he does derive the, the dispersion law, and he does realize that his dispersion law must be wrong since he is getting the integral of v. And he has this very famous footnote where he thanks Landau for pointing out that it should be the scattering length and not the integral of v. And that's what he does at that point. Um, the Li Huang Yang paper, they do a pseudo-potential approximation. They put in the scattering length. Well, I don't really understand, I'm afraid, what they do. But in the end, there is only the scattering length in what they do. So they're not really worried about the difference between the integral of v and the scattering length. For us, the struggle was really to understand how the integral of v became the scattering length. And I want to show you now that if you ignore the four A terms, after having done C number substitution, if you keep, I mean, Bogolyubov tells you that, I mean, the argument is that you should think of A being small, A or A dagger being small, and you ignore it if you have too many of them. Um, the point is, if you ignore the terms with four A's, you're not going to get the scattering links. If you keep the four A's, you will get the scattering links. In the leading term, and I'd like to show you that calculation, and you might say, how do we do that? How do we keep the four terms, the four A's, in the Bogolyubov approximation? Well, I will not do a Bogolyubov approximation. I will instead just using, use it for an upper bound. So I will, I will consider a Bogolyubov, I don't know, sometimes I put in an I and sometimes I don't, Bogolyubov trial state. So what do I mean by Bogolyubov trial state? I mean a state of the form that it would minimize the quadratic Hamiltonian. Right? So these are quasi-free states or states that satisfy Wick's theorem, where I can calculate expectation values using Wick's theorem. Right? Or I should be a little more precise here. This is after C number substitution. But what do I mean by C number substitution for a trial state? Really what I think of doing is you can do the, you can take the A0 and you can replace it by A0 plus square root rho L. Let, let me just do all of this in three dimensions. Right. Now this is done just by a replacing A0 by A0 plus square root, by plus some number, and not changing all the other A's, that's just a unitary transformation. So I can do this unitary transformation first. Then I replace the Hamiltonian by a unitarily equivalent Hamiltonian. And then I try that out in a state that satisfies Wick's theorem. Right? If, you do, if you do Wick's theorem normally, all the odd expectation values, A's with odd numbers, would be zero. But I really want to keep that the, also the odd expectations are non-zero because of the condensate. So the way I just do it is I first do the, this unitary transformation. And then I use a, uh, well, what I would call the quasi-free or Gaussian state. Right, so I would use this plus quasi free. And then 
if I assume from the beginning that I do this calculation in the thermodynamic limit, I can sort of write down immediately a thermodynamic state. Right? I can introduce the, assume that the state, that the expectation value of A dagger P, A, P is just a function of P, and I just think of momentum now being in the whole space. I sort of assume that I'm creating a translation invariant state and I'm calculating everything per volume, right? then I usually introduce the alpha p, that's the a dagger p, a dagger minus p. So I'm here, I'm using a grand canonical trial state. Right? Because when I do this and then go to a quasi-free state, it's really a grand canonical state. But that's not important since we have equivalence of ensemble. So I can, certainly, I can certainly do that and get the right answer. So I want to express the energy per volume in terms of these two quantities, the A dagger P, A, P, and A dagger P, A dagger minus P. I'm assuming everything here is real, and it depends only on the momentum. Right. That's this one, yes. The, 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 the sure. And then the squeezing that's exactly what I'm doing. That that's exactly what this so is, right? Using their wave function. Yes, I'm basically using their wave function. And the functional that I'll write down has, has been written down a long time ago. I forgot who did Stickley and Solomon. I don't know exactly. Okay, I, I didn't know that reference, but yeah. Uh, no, no, it's a, fairly, it's a fairly standard way to try to write down. Well, I don't really use the squeezing because I do not diagonalize anything. So I use, I use the translation, right? The, the, I, I use this, the, the displacement. This, that one I use to replace the Hamiltonian by one that's unitarily equivalent. I could do the other thing, but the, what, what I choose to do instead is to say the, 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 the resulting Hamiltonian, I now evaluate in the state that satisfies Wick's theorem, and then I minimize over all possibilities. Right? That, 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 it, I think it's essentially the same. Right? With two former PhD students, we actually analyze this functional quite carefully proved that there were minimizers, studied the dilute limit. And I want to just briefly argue here that when you want to see the dilute limit and you do it in that case, in, with, with such a trial state, you will get the leading term for pi rho squared A, which I think is surprising. In the and that was not noticed by us. This was, this was actually noticed by Erdos, Schlein, and Yao. Um, uh, but what we did, we analyzed it carefully and saw you will not get Li Huangyang. You cannot get Li Huangyang for such a, from such a trial state. You have to do something different, and I'll try to explain uh, what it is that you have to do differently. But you end up with an energy per volume, which has the following form. I have until 10.45. How is this? Yeah. Um, so it looks like this. Uh, so there's this p squared gamma of p dp. There's originally a sum. There's a sum here. I do the expectation, so I get the sum over p squared gamma of p. But then if I calculate per volume, I'll get the sum divided by a volume, and I think of the limit, so it's an integral. Right? So I can immediately, in the thermodynamic limit, it, as the energy per volume, I'll get, I'll get that term. Then I'll get the term that Bogolubov found, the integral. So, so V hat of zero is, I'm just using the Fourier transform notation. That's just the integral of V of x dx. Right, so in general, I'm using the Fourier transform. And then I'll get. I'll get the terms that correspond to having two, A's, two zeros and two non-zeros. 
and then I'll get the terms with four non-zeros, right? I only get an even number because I do an expectation value in, one, in a quasi-free state, which does not have any odd expectations. So I do not get anything from with the three A's, I mean the one, uh, one zero and three A's, those I don't get. I also then don't get the one with three zeros and one P, but that one would not conserve momentum, so it's not there at all anyway. But the one with three A's, I do not get in an expectation like that. Um, so then for the term, so I could write it like this. It's E gamma alpha rho naught. So actually, let me call this rho naught. You may really not want to say that it's completely, right? you, 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 you define the, the density and the condensate, and then you want to calculate what it is eventually. So we would get 2 pi to the minus 3 v hat of p gamma of p plus alpha of p. That's the term that you're getting from here when you have two of them being zero being replaced by, by a row. And then you get the terms coming from the four A's So that's the, uh, that is the functional that you would get in this case here. And I want to show that if you, so what Bogolyubov, if you took to, to repeat the Bo, uh, standard Bogolyubov approximation, you would ignore that term. And you just minimize, you just minimize the rest. And then you end up with, this, with the formula that Bogolyubov has in his paper. So, now, I should say, that there is a condition between the alpha and the gamma that alpha of p squared is less than or equal to gamma of p times gamma of p plus 1. You have this condition. And in fact, for a pure state, if you have a pure quasi-free state, you would actually have an identity here. But since I minimize, I want to have an identity anyway. So that's a, that's a condition. And that's basically because the this operator, this thing here. I'm assuming everything is real. This is actually a positive operator, right? So it's determinant is positive, and that gives you uh, that gives you this condition. Okay. So now let me just let me not go through the details here. Let me just tell you how you get the scattering length coming in from minimizing this problem. And the point is that you're actually getting it from a, from a range where, the, where, as Bogolyubov said, that you should think of A being very small. So you should think of the gamma being very, very small. And the alpha of P is essentially, so we're going to assume that alpha of P squared, so for the minimizer, we will have alpha of P being equal to minus square root gamma of p, gamma of p plus 1. Oh, that's really to try to minimize this term here. So, and, and we want to think of gamma being very, very small. So since gamma is small, then alpha of p is actually essentially, or let me put it like this, alpha of p squared is essentially gamma of p. This can all be done rigorously. I just wanted to give you an idea of the calculation. So up here, I'm going to replace gamma of p by alpha of p squared. So we get approximately we would get integral p squared alpha of p squared dp plus and again, I will ignore this gamma of p. It's actually small, so I keep only the alpha of p. And let me actually rewrite it back in, in sort of in x space. So, I, so this is actually the v of x. And let me write it like this, the alpha check. So 
meaning that I go back, I, ant, I anti Fourier, tra inverse Fourier transform it as a function of x dx plus, that was, that was the term here, I ignore that term. And here I ignore this term, but I keep that term, right? So this is integral one half uh, v of x alpha check of x squared dx. So I get this expression in, this, in the alpha. Right? I get this expression in, in that term here. Right? And I just wanted to argue that if I look at the variational equation for this, it will actually give you the scattering equation. Right? Because you see there is a p squared alpha of p squared here. So this is now like a, a gradient term. Um, so now which one is it? So the variational equation is that I'd get minus Laplacian alpha check, right? I mean, this thing here I can write as alpha check Laplacian alpha check, right? And I do a variation in that. For the last term over here, I get one half v alpha check, so that we recognize the scattering solution already there, except that we also have the last term, which is, um, on, sorry, and I made a mistake. I forgot to put in. Ah. I did say that these terms here came from having two a's, and the other two being the square uh, coming from the, the, the A0, but that has to have a square root of rho in it. So there is actually a, if you want, a rho naught on that term. I'm sorry, I forgot that. Right, that comes from the two A0s, which had been replaced by shifting them. And after shifting, I keep the one that has two A's in that term there. And for now, for the leading term, I will actually ignore the difference between rho naught and rho, so I'll say it's essentially the same. Right? You have to be more careful if you want to analyze it to higher accuracy, but that gives me a one-half rho times v. Right? That comes from the, ah, I forgot it there also. <laughs> So, uh, so you might say, well, why, why there's a half? Well, that's because when I do the derivative, the variational equation, there's really a two coming down in those terms and nothing coming down there. And then I divide by two, and then I get that this is the, this is the variation. OK, so recall that the scattering, we had the scattering equation. Which was minus Laplacian u plus 1 half v u being 0. And I was thinking of u being 1 minus the omega. And I now want to argue that the alpha check is really minus rho times the scattering solution, right? That, at least that, that it satisfies this equation right there. Right? Uh, because if you, if you plug it in, you will see that you can replace. So maybe let me, let me pull out a 
Let me pull out a row from here. And then you see that the alpha over rho is just the omega, so I can write this as 1 minus omega, since the Laplacian doesn't see the 1, or the 1 doesn't see the Laplacian. And for the other two, you get exactly the 1 half v. You, uh, I, I don't know what I'm saying, but. That's the equation that I have over there. That's exactly the, exactly the same as the scattering equation. Now you can put it, you can plug this back in, and you find that you get the scattering length. OK, all this was just to convince you that you cannot ignore the 4a terms if you want to get the 4 pi rho squared a. Right? You, you need to keep it uh, in the upper bound. You need to keep it as well in the lower bound for that reason. And I'll explain how we keep it in the lower bound. Yes? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's what I'm keeping. But that's necessary in order to re-express everything from the scattering length, yes. because otherwise you're that's missing right. a scattering You're missing, you're, so, so, so one way that Bogolyubov could already have seen part of the scattering length would have been if he had expanded the, if, if he had, so he, has the, he, had the, he had an expression, right, in, in his, uh, in, that he wrote down where he has a term the, sort of the term that gives you the Li Huang Yang, that integral that gives you the Li Huang Yang. If you there replace the potential V, Fourier transform, V hat of P, only by V hat of zero, which is usually done in an approximation, then you would get a divergent integral. You can only do it after having, so now it's getting a little bit technical, but okay, but. Uh, but there is a way to renormalize it, and then you renormalize it by getting exactly the second term in the Born series. Right? So already there, it was clear that you need that, that the second term in the Born series was already there, even just keeping just the, the two zeros. But this is you need to keep more all the terms in the Born series, right? Which is what we are doing, what we are doing here. So um, um, okay. Now, unfortunately, analyzing this functional up there does not give you Li Huang Yang. And that's because you have ignored the three A terms. You need, I'm sorry. Um, we have to keep the three A terms. Right? And the three A terms was kept in the upper bound that was got the Li Huang Yang formula. And really, the way we think of it, so to get Li Huang Yang, you need to keep terms of the following form, which is so still a square root rho if you want, but you have an A dagger P, A dagger K um, plus P A of K of minus K. Um, like that. So something that, that's of this form will p small and k large. So usually what you do is, as you said, you do the scattering against the condensate. p and minus p scatter against the condensate. In order to get the Li Huang Yang, the scattering length there, you need to scatter the, a large pair, k minus k, Against momenta that are, that are very close to the to the um, to the to condensation, but you cannot go all the way only to condensation. You are not going to get the A term in the scattering. So we call these the soft pairs. So one had to take this Bogoliubov trial state and add terms like this as well. And if I want to think of it in terms of of, of a wave function. Um, so 
right? If I, if I look at the wave function picture, right, we would have psi being, well, there's a 1 from the condensate, and then you would have a sum of the scattering function between pairs, and then you would have a product of two of them. But always, when you do bogol yupov you would always have disjoint pairs, right? So you would have x1, x2, I mean, sums of the form xi, xj, xk, xl, where k and l are, I mean, the set. They're both different from i and j. Whereas for the soft pairs, you can have, uh, so, so these would be, say, of the form x1 minus x2, f x3 minus x4. That's what you would have in bogol yupov all kinds of products like that, but never overlapping pairs. The soft pairs allow you, to some extent, having x1 minus x2 and x2 minus x3, but never more than three. Right? But then you can go all the way to the Jastrow wave function, right, where you do the product of, uh, right. here I better write something else, because it's not, it's not this, here f is really the scattering, uh, related to the scattering solution. But down there, I can try to do a Jastrow wave function, where g is essentially of the form of one plus d, one plus df. And the question is what terms to keep here when you start expanding. Right? So Bogolyubov keeps only terms that are non-overlapping. This thing with the soft pairs, you allow maybe one overlapping pair to get the upper bound for the hard sphere. It's clear that you need the full thing. And if you do that, and that's what has been done in the confined case, so we can do the, the Li Huang Yang hard sphere in the confined, in the gross Pitaevsky limit. It's simply done by doing this and start expanding. The problem is if you go to the thermodynamic limit, you are just getting too many pairs interacting because they will interact over very, very long distances. And it just breaks down. There's just no way we can understand this calculation. So we do not know how to do the hard sphere by doing a gesture of type wave function and just trying to expand in one plus f or even uh, try to, I mean, we don't know how to do it. So, okay, let me get to the, to the lower bound. Um, So for the upper bound, condensation was not really an issue because you just take trial states that are condensed already. But for the lower bound, we cannot do that. We have to prove condensation, right? In order to do the bogol to prove that sort of the C number substitution is in any way a right thing to do, we have to establish condensation. So the issues is how to establish condensation. And how to treat three and four A terms. What I mean by this is in the, I guess what happened to my second quantization formula up there. After condensation, imagine that you can do some C number substitution. You can control that. How do you treat the three and four A terms? You have to do both, as I tried to argue, to get A in the four pi rho squared A and to get the A in the leaf one young term. 
And as I hope I explained to you, we do not know how to prove condensation. But let me just let me just discuss what the problem is. So in general, what we would like to show, what does condensation mean? For us, it means that the expectation value in the ground state of A0 dagger A0 divided by L cubed does not converge as L goes to infinity to some quantity which is different from um, to some rho naught, which is different from zero. Right. That's what we would like to show, and we don't know how to show that. Right. So as L goes to infinity, psi being the ground state, the Hamiltonian Hn, the number of particles in the zero momentum, or even for that matter, even a slightly changed momentum, right? Which is, that's also fine. Um, but it has to be one momentum only. And the natural thing is to put in p equals zero, establishing that this, as L goes to infinity, converges to something non-zero. We are extremely far from proving anything. And I'd like to discuss to what extent this has been seen experimentally. I think it has, but, but because what I want to say is that we can prove it if we go to a different scale. So the way we get around it in the proof is to look at a confined case. What did I do with the raising? So if L... is of order square root rho a, or sorry, one over square root rho a. That's the healing length Then we know that a substantial number of particles will be in the condensate. So then we do know condensation, yes. Right. No, it's not zero. And it's just curious. Is it something like a chimerical community is thinking about? Yeah, no, no, that's, yeah, sure. I mean, this is not, that, that in itself is not really, uh, is really the issue. You can fix this by doing the boundary conditions if you want, right? So you can say that you're just looking at, at a psi which is real and you're, you're minimizing no, the real. Sure, sure, sure. No, no, so, so, so the, the, the way we really want to prove, what we really mean by condensation is that if you look at the, if you look at the, at the one particle density matrix, right? So uh, gamma PQ, if you want, so psi A dagger P a cube psi. So you look at the one particle density matrix. What we want, if you want to show condensation, it really means that this has an eigenvalue, which is of order n. So you can, you can formulate it in a unitarily invariant way, right? So you would like this. So gamma, so has eigenvalue of order n. I mean, here, the, the way I define the gamma here, the trace is n. Yes. Okay, not tractable analytically, but then what you mean by single particle density matrix for the rest of the relations is not single particle for bare operations. No, that's what I mean is always, I always think of the density matrix for the bare operator when I write this down. That's right. Yes. You could, of course, ask what would you get for the dress, for some dressing operator. Yes, that, that is true, but that's not what we mean, mean by condensation. By condensation, we mean the 
this, the, the, the many body wave function, you do the one particle density matrix, you look at it for any ground state, not an approximate ground state, but for any ground state, you'd like to know that it has, uh, and the ground state is actually unique, right? If, if you look at bosonic systems, depending, it depends on boundary conditions, but it's unique, right? And depending on what type, if I do this, say, the periodic case, then it should be this one here that should converge to something non-zero. Right? And we do, as I said, we do not know how to prove this. Right? But if, if we are in this situation for the healing length, then we do know how to prove it. Right? Basically, what that means is that if I take my wave function, my ground state, and zoom into a window of size of the healing length, so if I look at the one particle density matrix and I look at its eigenfunctions, right, then the eigenfunction will sort of large, there, there, there could be many, it could be that, the, that there are many eigenvalues and there's not one with eigen of order n, but they're spreading out of a momentum range. But what we can show is that if we look at all of them in some window, they look constant in that window, right? So that we do have condensation in some window. Or I can reformulate it as just saying I'm looking at the confined problem, I look at this problem, one over square root rho a, say you're doing it on a torus, and then I ask, what is the occupation number here? And then we can prove that that occupation is of order n. And let me just briefly say how this is proved, because this is actually very, very simple, right? Because as soon as you confine, you create a gap in the, in the Laplacian. Right in there. And how big is the gap? So now let me just imagine I'm still in the periodic case, right? In the periodic case, the ground state of the Laplacian is momentum zero. But what is the next eigenvalue above that? This is something that goes like one over the length scale squared, right? So you have a gap of order one over one over L squared. Right? Yes. Confinement. What I mean by confinement is that I restrict to, I don't go to the thermodynamic limit, but I fix the length scale of my box to be the healing length. Right? And that will create a gap of that order, right? And then if I ask if n plus, let me introduce n plus the number of excited particles, not in the condensate, that costs, because of the gap, n plus over L squared in energy. Right? But L, I had chosen L to be 1 over rho A, so this is n plus rho A, which is exactly the order of the number of particles if I even look at the leading term. So by, in this way, if I know that the leading term is correct, I, had, I, need, I know that this is small. Okay. Now, a posteriori, if I've been able to prove the Li Huang Yang, I can even do better than the, because I've gained down to square root rho a cubed, so then I can do a little bit better than this length and still prove condensation by this type of algorithm. But we cannot go beyond that. Right? So we only know condensation on scales of order of the healing length. And then the question is, what has actually been seen experimentally? I mean, are we, the confined problems we look at, are they of the order of, much longer than the order of the healing length? I mean, I tried to look at some of the experiments, and it looked to me that they were essentially of the same order, the healing length and the, and the gap that you get, right? But I'll, I'll get to that in a, I'll, I'll be happy to discuss that, to what extent we actually know condensation experimentally in the thermodynamic limit. I think we do experimentally, but, but it's still a question whether the struggle we are having is maybe also a question that can be addressed experimentally. Okay. But that's what we do. We simply localize our problem, and that is really difficult. So the step one in solving condensation is achieved by localizing. 
And that sounds easy. It's not. Uh, so in paper we wrote back in 2020, 2022, that was almost half of the paper to try to localize in the way when you localize, you pay localization errors. You have to control that these errors still work along the way. And unfortunately, when we localized, the local, localized Hamiltonian, what part of the price you pay is that the Laplacian, the kinetic energy, no longer looks like the kinetic energy. It has to be massaged, and it's very difficult. It was very complicated to analyze. We still managed to do it. I don't want to get into that too much. Very recently, this has been improved by doing what's called the Neumann localization, right? You use the fact that if you do the Laplacian in a big box, then if you just look at a lot of smaller boxes, you can just ignore the kinetic energy between the boxes. And that's really the same as introducing Neumann boundary conditions between the small boxes. That would give you a lower energy. The problem with doing this is that it's not a periodic box that you're getting. And now all momenta couple to each other in this, when you do Neumann localization. But they finally found a way, people that have worked on this from a mathematical point of view, to do it with the Neumann localization, which is much simpler than what we did. I'd rather finish by discussing um, how to treat the three and four body terms. Just really uh, briefly, so I guess I'd have to lower Maybe the top one. Because as we saw, we cannot ignore, and this is also where we need the V being positive. Right? So, um, so may maybe, I mean, since this, this is open questions, I've already mentioned what I think are, for me, very important open questions. How to get away from V being positive. How to get an upper bound also for the hard sphere problem. So, so these are these are two uh, these are two problems. What was the third one? B, of course, B C. Yes, B C. That's so far out in the future that I even forgot about it. I think we are very far. So B C, uh, V positive, and the um, I keep forgetting one. Try again. B C, V being positive, and the upper bound for the for the hard sphere. These are the three open problems that. I at least still would like to think about, but I sort of left it to, younger, to a younger generation and started thinking about atoms instead. But let me finish with how we treated the, the, the four-body case. I should say that when you localize, you of course have to worry about what about the interactions of particles in different boxes? One thing is to localize the kinetic energy, but you also need to how the interaction is between boxes. But after all, it's positive. So you can ignore it for a lower bound. But that's, that's not right. That's, gonna give, that's too high a price to pay. So one has to also worry about, about that. Uh, but I don't want to discuss this. I want to discuss the confined problem. So I want to think of an L, and then I have the huge box, capital L, and I've put in lots of these smaller boxes. And in here, I introduce a projection P onto constant functions. Right, so P is simply the projection of one. Let's call the box B, one B, one over L cubed. I introduce this projection, and I introduce the excited particles, which is 1 minus that projection. Right? So the number of particles n in the box B, which now has to be treated grand canonically, because particles are moving in and out these boxes, that's the 1 B i, i equal 1. So let me call this n. This is the number of particles inside the box B. And particles are not jumping between boxes by the Hamiltonian. Right? It, 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 it commutes with the Hamiltonian. So I can fix the n. I just don't know what it is. In that sense, it's grand canonical. But this is a sum over the pi plus the sum over the q. 
qi, and this is n naught. These are the confined number of confined particles, and this is n plus. I have to go away from second quantization. And what I do with the interaction, the sum on i less than j, v of xi minus xj, is I write it out by putting a pi plus qi. I mean, I just put an identity twice on both sides. And then I expand that 16 terms. And exactly, it's exactly the same thing as with the A zeros and the A's. Now it's just called P's and Q's. So there are terms with no Q's. This is the PPPP term. This is the 4A zero term. There are terms with three, one Q, because we no longer have translation invariance after we've cut it down. So there are terms with one Q, two Q, three Q, and four Q. And we cannot throw any of them away. So we want to find out what is it that we can throw away. And actually, what we throw away is the following term. And that's actually one of the basic ideas in the paper we did when we proved the, when we proved Li Huang Yang, was the realization, whoops, ah, OK, got stuck. So it's a very simple idea, but as you will see, it really relies on V being positive. We use that the following expression is positive. Some i less than j. And then we do want to think of the, well, maybe I, I need more space. I do want to think of the four Q terms, right? It's up there, the term with the four Qs. But I cannot ignore the terms with the four Qs. Then I'm throwing out the baby with the bathwater because I will not get the scattering. So what we throw out is the following term. And this omega is the one from the scattering solution. So we put in the scattering solution there. We do the same over here. This term, because V is positive, and what I have here is the adjoint of what I have there, so W here is a function of, uh, sorry, omega, is a function of xi minus xj. Same thing over there. Omega is a function of xi minus xj. This is the adjoint of that. So this whole expression is greater than or equal to 0. So what we do is we add and subtract that term. And then we throw out the added term because it's positive. And what does it do? So basically what we're saying that for a lower bound, simpler way of saying it, for a lower bound, I can subtract this positive term. And you see it will cancel all the four Qs. So that will be gone. And it will renormalize all the other terms, the four Ps, the four P terms, the one Q term, the two Q term, and the three Q terms will all be renormalized. Now they will be renormalized. So this, so subtracting this, renormalizes. the one, two, three Q terms, and it removes the four Q term. And what, how does it renormalize? It renormalizes it by replacing V either by omega V, that's if I use only omega on one side, so Q, Q with this, or if I use from both sides, it will renormalize it by, really it's a subtraction, right? So it's one minus omega V, or it will renormalize it to 1 minus omega squared v. 
This is exactly VU, an integral of VU is 8 pi A. So I get the scattering length coming out after this quite simple renormalization. Now, so that's a very simple idea, but it actually allowed us to replace the Hamiltonian by a renormalized Hamiltonian, in which at least all the terms were now finite if we did the Bogolyubov approximation. We still do not get the right answer for a Bogolyubov approximation because we still need to understand how to treat the three Q terms. That's why the paper ended up at almost 100 pages. But I've already spent more than five minutes additional time. So thanks a lot for your attention.